So, um, we're ready to start. Um, thank you all for showing up. Um, let me welcome you um, in the name of uh, GameSnap Berlin Brandenburg and AWS GameTech to our webinar of today. Uh, in which um, Sebastian Baer and um, Sasha and, and Mike Bate will um, show you a little or, or tell you a little about um, what AWS um, uh, Game Tech can, can do for you. Um, and we also have Joachim Molanda from Jaeger here, um, who will later show what um, AWS Game Tech already has done for them. Um, so, it is one of our regular webinars, so you can ask questions in the uh, question and answer tabs, which will be answered um, at the end of the session um, following the presentations of Sebastian and Joachim. Um, you can also use the chat function, which both um, are located under the presentation screens. And um, other than that, I will just hand over to Sebastian Baer and um, let him start the presentation. So thanks everybody for joining and Sebastian, stage is all yours. Thank you, Lars. Thank you. So let me do screen share, just a second. So you should all see my screen now. So hi everybody, thanks for joining um, the talk today that I'm gonna do on Behind Great Games, there's Game Tech. My name is Sebastian and uh, the goal for today is that I will shed some light on what AWS Game Tech can bring uh, to you on, on, on your business, your, your, your game startup, for example. Um, but before I start, some brief information about myself. Um, I'm a long-time Amazonian, having worked for the company since almost eight years. And I joined Amazon's cloud division last year and I'm currently managing the games industry vertical in DACH. Um, prior to joining Amazon, um, I have worked in the games industry for quite some time and I have filled out various roles over the time, ranging from Q&A to game design to biz dev to sales and marketing. In uh, today's session, I'm going to talk about um, certain areas that I've outlined here. Um, I will start with a brief introduction into AWS and the AWS cloud. Um, and then I will give you specific information about the benefits of cloud adoption for game studios. And then I will tell you what is of, of special interest in around game tech, where we solely focus on um, game developers. I will also share some specific use, ca use cases and examples from AWS customers that have used our technology for their games. And last but not least, I will also share with you some resources and getting started material. Um, but before we start um, to go deeper into the, the, the single items, um, for those who are joining and who are, might not be so familiar with AWS and the cloud in general, I want to give you a quick summary um, of who we are and what we do. So Amazon Web Services, or short AWS, um, is a global provider of cloud services. And, and we help game studios provision the core building blocks of infrastructure, which is uh, storage, compute, database, networking, and security. So an on-demand pay-as-you-go model, and we broadly refer to as the AWS cloud. Um, as an on-demand service, the cloud enables studios to, mo uh, to move much more quickly in response to player feedback and demand. And because you don't have to worry about provisioning IT resources, it helps clear the way for you to really focus on the key identifiers of your business, which is creating great games and innovating um, on a constant basis. So when we start uh, talking about innovation, which is key for success, um, because the way game studios can compete today is on quickest time to market, keeping costs low and continuing to innovate the gameplay on behalf of your audience. And there are four areas I want to highlight that on. Um, first, uh, because we have a pay-as-you-go pricing on AWS, your studios don't have to estimate how much computing resources uh, they need to provision and pay up front um, for computing infrastructure. Instead, with AWS, uh, you pay only for resources you use, like a similar like to utility, like electricity or water, for example. Um, also, our on-demand infrastructure allows, allows you to spin up resources, computing resources, where you need them, when you need them, in a matter of single minutes, which just some mouse clicks. Um, and you don't need to invest some time in building up resources and, and compute resources, which might take you in the old world like a couple of weeks or even months. 
Um, and this increases dramatically your agility of game deployment and minimizes latency. Also, thanks to the cost efficiency um, benefits of the cloud in general, our customers are able to experiment often and fail fast with lower risk, which is so essential when you, when you have uh, games live and running. Because the cloud allows you to experiment at small scale and in multiple iterations without risking upfront investments in servers, for example. The ultimate benefit in this is that experimenting often will also include uh, the likelihood of finding the right direction for your game to succeed. All this ultimately means that you can focus on your core business value of creating great games. Your time and energy should be spent on building the best possible game for your players to enjoy, not with provisioning, maintaining, or building hardware resources and servers. So, but what's, what's in the game in general? Um, according to data from New Zoo, the um, global games business will generate up to 150 billion US dollars in turnover this year. Um, and we estimate that there are at least 3,200 game studios in Europe alone with more than 7,000 developers constantly experimenting, building and creating ga great games. Games have become an even larger uh, part of the pop culture, as you're probably all aware of. Um, and I suppose all of you know about Fortnite. Epic Games, the studio behind uh, uh, Fortnite, have done an exceptional job in blurring the lines between games, film and music and creating exciting in-game experiences. You might have also joined Fortnite when there was the Travis Scott event in April this year, which at the peak had more than 12 million concurrent users as peak, which has, something, has been something that has never been done so far. And Fortnite is a game that enjoys tremendous reach all over the world, playable across mobile, console, and PC. And it all runs on game tech, on AWS game tech. Whether you're a team of one or 1,000, um, only one thing really matters, making a game that players want to play. And how to get there is the ultimate question. And this is where we can help. So AWS Game Tech provides robust, scalable technology solutions for every stage in your game's life cycle, regardless of your studio size. Whether you build your game on core AWS service or use some of our managed game services to scale, our focus is to be the co uh, most customer obsessed company in the games industry. And because making the right infrastructure, choices matter. If you're a developer and just start from scratch, picture all the things you need to do and everything that's codependent on a success for your game. As highlighted here, it's all about content distribution, monetization, creating core backend services and building up an analytics pipeline to gather data and make informed decisions. So we really keep that flywheel spinning all the time. Here, is, here are some examples of studios that rely on AWS tech. Um, and those, those examples or customers range from AAA studios like Ubisoft or Riot Games as, small, as well as smaller independent studios. And we also have a, a, a growing footprint also in Germany, for example, with customers like Vuga, Flare Games, Decker, and Jaga, which we will hear later on in the session today. The power of AWS and its use of games is much more vast. More than 175 full feature services, many of which are used by game developers across the globe, including MII, ML, tools like Amazon SageMaker or powerful cloud compute tools like Amazon EC2 um, or AWS Lambda for serverless or storage solutions like Amazon EBS or Amazon S3 and inter interactive big data analytics tools like Amazon Alcina and Amazon EMR. This deep portfolio of services paired with AWS expensive infrastructure represents the true power of the cloud. And broadly speaking, we group the most common use cases for game customers into three major areas, which I will be focusing in the next couple of minutes. It will be about backend services, computer networking capabilities, database and analytics solutions, and machine learning and AI use cases. So let's start with backend services um, and about infrastructure, especially backend services. When it comes to compute, we often talk about raw compute power. And often game servers are the first solution we hear about in that context. AWS Game Tech gives you flexibility to choose a route best suited to your need. And if you have AWS competency, which by the way, is not so hard to obtain, 
you can create customized server infrastructure in the cloud while maintaining control over your environment. And you can design your own architecture with the aid of AWS well-architectured framework, for example. Or if you prefer to have a managed service with Amazon Gamelit, for example, you can ship your game faster and quickly bring players the game experience they expect. You can maintain your servers with less operational resource and get updates, patches, and new content with ease whether you're looking for a fully managed solution or just the feature you need. A service like GameLift helps you maximize cost savings while delivering the lowest latency possible for your players. Now let's look a, look a bit deeper into Amazon GameLift. Because with Amazon GameLift, you can deploy, operate and scale dedicated servers as a managed service for session-based multiplayer games that leverage the power and availability of AWS. But how does Amazon GameLift actually work? So you have players and they want to get connected to game servers. They come in through your game service and then ultimately are managed onto game servers by GameLift. And GameLift itself is comprised of three basic layers. Layer number one is FlexMatch, which is an optional matchmaking service to form player matches based on flexible rules that you define. Second is queues which is a service that routes players to a lowest latency in regions globally. And the third layer is fleets, which, which you host your server build on game servers and scale up and down based on your need. So basically at the end, you have your players that get authenticated, matched into games by either your matchmaking service or FlexMatch. And these matches get sent to queues to direct them to the lowest latency servers to play your game. Some examples I want to highlight in this context is, um, is Behavior Interactive, which is a studio based in Montreal, and they are one of the largest independent game developers in the world, with close to 600 employees and over 70 million games sold on every platform. In um, 2019, its most successful IP, Dead by, Light, Dead by Daylight, has celebrated more than 12 million active players. As Dead by Daylight has continued to grow, so did the need for cloud services. And by moving the game from listen servers to dedicated servers on Amazon GameLift, they were able to improve the ping time of a game a lot, making the game much faster, making latency much more equal for players thanks to the robust backend. And when it comes to scale, we also need to talk about Fortnite because Fortnite is, an, is a great example and that shows um, how AWS can help um, to, to reach a capacity or a scalability which has never been seen so far. Um, because Fortnite is a game that has more than 250 million average users with more than 12 million average concurrent players all over the world. And to balance the game, identify anomalies and cheaters and scratch bugs and improve performance, Fortnite is supported by a massive data warehouse housing petabytes over petabytes of data. And another example I brought from Germany, it's about Decca Games. They are, they are a publisher um, located here in Berlin. Um, they have an interesting business model um, as they completely focus on live operations and games as a service. That means they take over and revive games um, as they age or when the original developer can no longer support them. However, those old games come with legacy, a legacy infrastructure. Um, and it's, it's, it's fairly complex to still then uh, come up with cost benefits and stuff because of that old architecture. So they heavily relied on AWS to still come up with, with, with measures to reduce cost and make them cost efficient so they can run them as long as possible. And we were able to support them, for example, with the use of spot instances. And a spot instance is a purchase option that allows you to purchase unused Amazon EC2 compute capacity at a highly reduced rate. Let's now briefly talk about database and analytics. Live games succeed based on the ability to listen to their players, learn what they want and deliver at a moment's notice. Through AWS services like Amazon Aurora or Amazon Neptune, games like Fortnite or Dead by Daylight or League of Legends are able to store petabytes of player data in the cloud and analyze them in real time, helping them make key decisions to improve gameplay. The bigger games get, the more games or the more data they generate. Understanding the data will allow you to continue to grow and retain your player base by making better design decisions with analytics. Implementing a game analytics pipeline on AWS allows you to ingest, store and analyze telemetry data 
that makes game improvements such as adjusting the difficulty level or providing more weapon upgrades when there is the need. And you do this almost in real time. One of the examples I have here is from Supercell, um, who have a game called Clash of, Nat uh, Clash of Clans that has generated more than 2 billion installs since its launch more about seven years ago. They have a unique culture and work in small independent teams, reducing the need for hierarchy and processes. But even with a small team, they were able to, to move its 300 databases to Amazon Aurora, a fully managed relational database that's ideal for scalable game data, given them better speed and agility, which is, which is so essential in this kind of gameplay. Finally, let's touch on machine learning and AI. You have all this data, but what do you do with it? Well, this is where developers can take advantage of some of the amazing capabilities of machine learning in AWS. We have customers using Amazon SageMaker to analyze massive data sets, to identify patterns, to help you surface game breaking bugs or balance issues in a multiplayer game. We're hearing from customers that are using Amazon machine learning to detect and sequester cheaters, moving these players away from legitimate players and keeping them quarantined with other cheaters where they can play against each other and you can still monetize them with ads, for example, which is an interesting use case. In this context, um, I want to briefly touch on a game from the franchise from Rovio, um, which comes from the Angry Birds series, it's called Dream Blast. And uh, traditionally speaking, QA is one of the least fun exercises in game development, but it's also super critical. The QA process can be a painful and time consuming exercise to complete. And in the mobile game space, developers are expected to be, uh, to be productive, to productive with new content all the time. And that's super tough when you also need to maintain a game. And Rovio ran into this exact challenge with Dream Blast. When Rovio launched Dream Blast, the developers were busy creating and releasing upwards to 40 new levels per week. This is incredibly difficult for a QA team, as you can imagine. So Rovio decided to use an innovative approach to simplify the process with machine learning. Using Amazon uh, EC2 and PyTorch, which is an open source framework for machine learning, Rovio built two bots that would play the game to look for bugs and estimate difficulty levels. One bot, used heuristic learning, taking into consideration the existing playability data and patterns that uh, Rovio already had gathered from their own players and estimated how a normal player might try to play the game. And the second bot, more interestingly, they created was based on reinforcement learning, effectively an algorithm with no history forced to teach itself to play the game. So imagine handing your phone to a two-year-old and you have an idea on how the sport played the game. They ran these simulations at massive scale on AWS, and they were able to dramatically simplify the QA process. And as a result, the developers and QA team was able to focus on making the game fun, which I suppose you all agree is the most important trait in game development. Another um, example I want to share in this context is coming from IO Interactive, who used Amazon Polly to provide a fast and cost-effective solution to generate dialogue for non-playable characters or NPCs in Hitman 2. Creating placeholder speech for your game cinematics allows your final use of voice talent more efficient and cost-effective. You can develop NPC that listen to natural language and respond with both text and voice using Amazon Lex. You can also create fun, immersive, voice-first games with Alexa, which is the virtual assistant AI technology developed by Amazon, first used in the Amazon Echo smart speakers that some of you probably also already have at home. When you're asking yourself now, how do you get started because you are so unfamiliar? Um, we have built some, some creative solutions for now that, are, that have been launched super recently. If you're starting from the scratch in terms of being familiar with the cloud, I highly recommend that you take the getting started with game tech course. The course is specifically for business decision makers and technical roles who work in game development. It's self-paced and takes you roughly 90 minutes. The course provides an overall introduction to AWS game tech and gives you some information about what service you use and what services are also um, managed according to your use case. And you can then make informed decisions what route you want to take. 
Once you got your foundational, foundational knowledge checked, you can then continue onto the rest of the learning path, depending on your role and which skills you have. So if you're a game developer, I would uh, suggest you take the compute path. If you are an analyst or um, you are a data engineer, I would suggest you take the um, analytics path. Um, if you are a solutions architect or you're wearing multiple hats, we recommend that you take both, both tracks. You can decide which one you take because they don't build up on each other. There are many ways you can get started by implementing a simple proof of concept, a pilot aligned to what problems you might want to solve with the help of the cloud. Some of these scenarios um, I already talked about earlier in this session, but as a reminder, these could include building an analytics pipeline, animating non-playable non characters, producing latency using a CDN, a content delivery network, so you can bring relevant content like game downloads or mods or promotional content and patches closer to your users. Or last but not least, doing game production in the cloud for remote working, which in current times can be a super interesting use case. Last but not least, um, I want to point out that we have prepared a special package for you to get started and to ease the pain to give it a try. And this package that we have uh, pro, pro, uh, built up consists of credits you can use uh, in, in, in trying out some services. It also includes business support for guidance and some more free additional training. Um, so this should actually reduce the risk and then also the, the risk of spending some money where you don't know what the results are. And this enablement package can reduce um, that risk for you. And in the assumption that for your specific use case, you don't find that, that, that package suitable, there's always the option to talk to us. And I put in here Abir, who's our senior business development manager, who would be your first point of contact in this context, where we can give some guidance on the use case, and then we can see what other options we have to make your proof of concept um, working with our enablement package that we have. This concludes my session, and now, um, I would want to hand it over to Joachim from, from Yaga Development. I will do and then uh, let me share my screen and then let's go over here and I hope everything is showing properly. Um, we just, um, I think everything works fine. Um, so I will uh, then uh, start talking. So first of all, we're just really glad, I'm really happy that I'm able to have the talk here and in general share a little bit of the history over Jaeger development and talk especially about how AWS have helped us recently to develop the current game that we have in development called Cycle. Um, to start off though, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Joachim Malander. Um, you probably hear by my accent that I originally do not come from Germany. I am due born and raised in Sweden. Um, I started programming at a very early age, around like 1998 on the C++ standard, and I consistently programmed almost through my whole uh, life. Um, but it wasn't only programming that I was very much interested in. I was also interested in video games and was constantly creating those as I went through my school. And once I educated from high school, I studied at a game school called Game Assembly. And once I naturally uh, educated from there, I decided to go to Jaeger here in Berlin, which I've now spent over seven years at. And I originally started as an intern, but now act as the technical director on the Cycle project. Uh, to give you a little bit of an overview of what this talk will be about, it will be divided in three sections. Uh, I will give you just a brief introduction to Jaeger if you do not know what that company is, and talk a little bit from a very high level point of view about what uh, Jaeger has done in regards to technological challenges and uh, large changes and transitions we have done during that time. Um, I will then talk a little bit about the development time for the current game that we have in development here at Jaeger called The Cycle. And then I will touch on how AWS have helped us make Cycle a reality, uh, because without AWS, it, a game such as Cycle from our studio would not have been possible. So um, to briefly then start, um, so I would like to start talking a little bit about Jaeger. Uh, the studio was originally founded in 1999. Um, it was done by five people who still work in the company today, um, either as managing director or art director and so on and so forth. Um, however, we're no longer only five people. We are around uh, roughly around 100 people from different countries, um, like uh, regions, diversity all around, um, a pure reflection of Berlin, um, I would say. And um, we all work currently on the cycle or another project that is yet to be announced. 
Um, so then to start talking a little bit about the games Jaeger had made from a very high level overview, it will become a little bit confusing because the first game that Jaeger ever made was also called Jaeger. Um, and from a base core technological fundamentals, it was uh, done in its own engine and it was released on Xbox and PC in both the US and EU region around 2003, uh, 2005, um, based on different publishing requirements. Once that game had been completed, we started working on the second game, which probably Jaeger is the most known for still to today, which would be Spec Ops The Line. Um, this was not made in the current, uh, like uh, in the own engine Jaeger developed, but uh, in Unreal Engine 3, uh, which marks the first time Jaeger used the propriety engine. And you could say it was also the first time Jaeger really started doing larger AAA development, both increasing the team size up to 60, 70 people, and to uh, a large extent, larger production budget and timelines to accomplish the game. Once the, we com completed that game, we started working on another game called Dawn 2. Uh, this was not developed in Unreal Engine 3, but in Unreal Engine 4. And it was our first avenue into open world development and more large scale multiplayer based uh, gameplay. Um, unfortunately, after around two years of um, development, there were some creative disagreements. So we discontinued the development ourselves on the title of Tron 2, uh, but started working then more on a game called Dreadnought, where we um, were also developing that one in Unreal Engine 4. Uh, but it was our first really avenue into free to play games. And also, most of our in regard for engineering staff, we started now interacting way more with backend technologies. And also, it, we had to orient a lot of our studios to become more game as a service and less of a box product game that we're releasing games in multiple years. We were had to release in patches and so on and so forth. What I hope to illustrate here just very quickly is uh, that we've made a lot of transitions in the company that we've had for over 21 years. Where we have made uh, the transitions from becoming an own engine company from then using propriety engines. Uh, we have made a lot of our technology stack not only be focused just on making games, but also becoming full stack, writing backend services and managing large those different technologies. And also how we were have transitioned from a traditional box product game over to becoming more a studio that develops game as a service. Now, this was the past and this was a brief introduction into Jaeger. Um, the main thing of the one of the games we currently now are developing that would like to give a little bit more broader in detail is, is the cycle. Now, um, if you do not, if you have never played the cycle, uh, then let me just give you a brief introduction of what that game is. Um, it is a PvVP first person competitive quest shooter, which is a match session based game where you drop down on our beautiful planet Fortuna 3 and you need to, um, you have 20 minutes to try your best uh, glory uh, and then successfully escape the planet. Um, it has a lot of different social uh, dynamics where there are opponents that are also dropped down on the planets that you can uh, join temporary alliances with. But it also contains a battle royale element where you're able to uh, not only team up with your friends, but also theoretically kill them or stab them in your back, uh, giving them not the award of being able to escape. Um, we are not, though, a tr truly traditional BR because in the end, our game is not about winning by killing the most amount of people and being the last person alive, but being the one that completes the most objectives on the planet and that successfully escapes out of this one. I hope this introduction was good enough. Um, I am not a game designer or creative director or something like that. Um, but if you would like to try it yourself, you're able to play this game right now. Just download it on the Epic Game Store and uh, please give us our feedback. Um, to talk a little bit about the origins of the, how this game originally came to be, um, it started with something that is pretty internal, what we have here, Jaeger, called something called Pitch Jam, where we um, have a one day where we get given a specific format over that we would like our game to be uh, like, we, we think the game industry in five years will be something like this. Um, every developer, you get a day to produce a small pitch, present that to the owners and to other stakeholders at the company, and then see what goes. I did that. Unfortunately, my game wasn't the cycle, but it was something else. Uh, but the cycle was, of course, the best one for the pitches that got presented. And then we started uh, publish, uh, pitching that to other publishers and investors. Uh, unfortunately, no publisher or investors were really interested in pitching, uh, investing in the game right at the start. Uh, but we ourselves as a studio really, really believed in the, uh, the cycle. Uh, which meant that what we decided to do then was for the first time ever, and here comes the fourth transition of the company, going from uh, primarily just working always with publishers to now trying to self-publish the title ourselves. And the thing is though, that contains a lot of challenges for us. 
Um, the challenge is sort of specific to have with the cycle then, as you can imagine, is we don't have any self-publishing experience. Um, so we both had to staff up, uh, staff up a team of uh, people that are able to take on that specific area, but also be able to find um, like ourselves the internal expertise and the knowledge to be able to do so. On top of it, we had quite a lot of tight deadlines. Uh, we always respect the funding that we're able to receive from publishers, but it does become a little bit different when it is actually your own internal money that you're operating yourself with. On top of it, uh, our employee count, well, I certainly was mentioning around 100 employees at the start. We were around 50 employees, especially at the start of Cycro. Um, that's quite a lot, low amount of things to be able to develop the game that I was previously explaining. To be able to extend that runway, also, especially myself and a couple of other uh, mostly tech people, we're doing quite a lot of uh, co-development to be able to extend the runway of the project. But it, of course, uh, diverges the specific um, work responsibilities that we had on the game. And as mentioned previously a little bit is that it was a pretty ambitious game. There was reasons why no publishers or investors wanted to invest in our game. There was also reasons why we ourselves really believed we would like to pull it off. But it required quite a lot of agility and quite a lot of iterations to make sure we were able to accomplish that given game. So this were the challenges and this was at the start of the project. Um, now to give you a little bit of an understanding over the two and a half years that we have had now during the development of this game, I would like to quickly go through the different stages. So after six months of working on the game, we were, went into pre-alpha, allowing um, people outside our own internal offices to play our game. Uh, we were sending out code in the EGS game store and people were able to play, give us feedback and so on and so forth. Um, we ran then six of these ones. Um, we ran then six of these monthly play tests. So like um, September, October, November, and so on and so forth. Uh, which in the end, uh, you can imagine that after we were on a six month, we naturally then turned into weekly ones, uh, where we would be uh, pulling our main development branch on Friday morning um, to the uh, to uh, our Epic EGS launcher, where people could download and then play our game, give us feedback during the weekend. We would have that feedback on Monday, and then we would iterate to again on the same next week, allow users to play our game. We did this, I think, for like 14, 15 times. And afterwards, once we concluded doing that, we uh, actually just naturally went into 24 seven because we were able to build this kind of slow pace um, into reaching that stuff, which we kind of did around like, let's say a year and two months or something like that, which we then started operating the game as a live service game. Um, so after we have been able to reach 24 seven, we then started really exploring with more larger set of packages. So something that's pretty natural in the games we sort of make is that there's season passes. So during the time uh, for around eight months, we developed three seasons, which would be season one, season two, and season three. And on top of it, other substantial things that was required for our individual game to make it grow, listen to uh, player feedback, and improve it as we go. Furthermore, we were also releasing in multiple regions, something we did recently, we released in the Asia region because we started getting a lot of people playing from there. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, we opened up the service for there. And on top of it, very soon, we'll be releasing multiple different platforms uh, such as Steam, but also different console vendors um, later uh, next year. Um, so I hope this is a timeline. Uh, this was around 50 employees that all, like you could imagine, ranges everything from artists to programmers my, like myself. And I could say that a couple of years ago, this would have not been possible, but one of the main contributors for allowing us to make this possible would be AWS. And it would not have been possible following this ambitious timeline. And I don't think we were ourselves be able to make the game such as the cycle if it wouldn't be through AWS. Um, to, I would like to the remainder of this talk to talk a little bit more in detail about the specific ways that AWS helped us with, but to just give you a little bit of a brief understanding about what the technical stack that goes in regard for the cycle is, is that we are using Unreal Engine 4. We've been using now Unreal Engine for like 16, 17 years. Um, so it was a natural way about how we build our game technology. Um, our backend services are new, developed for cycle. Uh, we use uh, Dockerized um, microservices. Uh, that communicate themselves through um, RabbitMQ and uh, coded in Google Protobuf. Uh, these, are, um, these are primarily written in C-sharp.net, but we also have some Golang services. Um, these are all orchestrated in Kubernetes. And everything of this, both our backend microservices, but also our game servers are all hosted in AWS. Um, there's a very good talk that we did two years ago called Backend Solutions for the Cycle at Unreal Fest 2018, if you're more interested about all the different other sections of this specific talk. 
but uh, or all the different other parts of our technology here. Uh, but what I would really like to continue talking about and highlight here would be the AWS part and the specific uh, elements at AWS that really helped us make Psycho possible. Um, so the first one is, I kind of mentioned the hosting part, and I don't think you can, like and Sebastian was mentioning previously in his talk also, and I don't think you can um, like say how much this has helped us because we at Jaeger, when we started the game, like we don't have any data centers and we were trying to very constantly focus on the game that we were trying to make, which was the cycle. Um, and here's a video that you can see um, on the right side because we don't know how many people were playing our game. We were having those monthly play tests and we did not really know how many would actually download the game and then experience it with us. So we were <laughs> using on our Twitter feed, playing around a little bit with like how many people were gonna play it. Uh, this was the first time during the second monthly play test we actually reached over a thousand people which was really really cool um so uh, that was really nice and it was awesome that we didn't have to build the data center hardware infrastructure ourselves and try to predict this we were very easily able to use aws cloud uh, to be able to provide that and not have any hindrance on top of it when we we're running these weekly play tests we were taking our main development branch which every developer was submitting at we weren't using a lot of branches at this given time and like we didn't know what someone sometimes would submit on the first evening uh, that would that they would want the players to experience on Friday. So that means that we couldn't really accurately predict exactly what kind of resources we wanted to do. And we were really trying to focus on what kind of game experience do we want and less of like what is the optimized performance and the resources to be able to accomplish that. And the ability to then be able to scale that is really important. On top of it, something that we think really important at Jaeger and I think on a lot of different companies is the balance between work and life. Um, and I can, uh, there have been so many times where we have a patch soon to come out. We really want to put that out to allow our players to be able to experience it. But we're noticing we're having a little bit of re uh, like performance problems. And instead of having to either do the normal game development through crunching, paying the little bit additional cost for a higher degree of scaling really helps us to allow people to spend more time having a normal life. And then we can go back and fixing those things reactively. Additionally, as well, something that AWS hosting also really allows us to do is the management of different resources. As I was mentioning, everything we have is hosted in AWS. That means our backend microservices. That means our uh, BAL services. I will probably consistently talk about these things, which is our very tight first-person shooter gameplay. But also what we released in season three, which is a more like MMO style hub where you're able to see other players and interact with their menus. All of these three things are hosted in AWS, but they have very different resource requirements and the ability to be able to define certain resources per different things are really, really awesome for us. I think also as Sebastian was mentioning as well, what is even awesome is we have all of these things that allows us to help in regards to scaling, but especially also it helps a team as ours to be able to have really nice predictable cost. We're able to balance the amount of prototyping we need to be versus optimization, giving us no longer a theoretical, like having to think too much ahead in regard for where our game will be. So we will know, know what kind of resources we need to have to run, but more be able to react um, and be able to alter, like how much should we prototype? Are we prototyping enough or should we need to optimize because we need to reduce cost there? There's some, we have monthly costs where we go through this and make really accurate data-driven decisions. On top of it, what is really, really nice is we are able to supply our game uh, multi-regional. So as I said, we are all in Berlin. This is the office of Cytus Spree that we're all located here in Berlin. And we do not have a lot of people in Asia or in the US, uh, but through AWS, we're able to very easily scale up to different uh, regions um, to allow our users to play a lot of our game. We had a, quite a huge influx of Asian players um, and we could pretty quickly react to say, hey, now we have enough Asian players, let's then open up the Asia region pretty quickly. And that by, by audience demand, we were able to very easily regionalize our game um, with, with saving as much cost as possible. Because what's really awesome is we can actually define the different regions where it really matters. Um, I was showing, I was talking a little bit about the kind of different dynamics our game has where we have the first person shooter, low latency experience in one place, but also these kind of more MMO style hubs and so on and so forth. And for instance, in this case, we can define to have a pretty uh, strong regionalized um, uh, session based inside for the first person player experience. We don't have to do it for our um, set, um, big station service. So this is really, really awesome for a 50 man team to be able to also have these dynamics. Also, the third thing that I think everyone that has ever worked on game as a service games probably know about is the elements of BI. 
Um, and I think everyone knows how important BI is for being able to make important decisions. Um, what we started with was actually a little bit more of an internalized solution where we would be storing everything on like a small internal database in, in Postgres. And then we would be like kind of directly querying that one. Um, that works fine for probably our first or second monthly pay test, but it doesn't scale, especially once we go 24 seven and start generating a lot of different data. We did a lot of different partitioning and like 20, like every 24 hours moving the data over and over again. But this was taking a lot of valuable resource time from our developers, which we could be focusing on making the game. Uh, what's really awesome is we recently started using uh, the specific solution between using Kinesis Firehouse to move those into parquets in S3, uh, then using AWS Glue extractors to be able to uh, find the specific schema that we can store those in S3, and then using Athena to query for a data analyst in whatever visualization tools we have. And this is something that has been like really useful for us where we have a very awesome uh, like uh, DevOps engineer called Tiago who certainly drove this uh, specific solution that we don't really have many employed data engineers. So be able to use AWS uh, to solve some of those immediate problems we have, I think is really awesome. Something we recently also started doing because we are a games company and not primarily a technology based company, we started using game lift much more. Um, this is specifically because like it's certainly you can build some microservices pretty quickly to get up to like five to 600 people and build kind of what your game was. But then the ability to then use industry proven solutions to really scale your game to a much more higher one and reach a very much higher degree of quality has really been awesome. Um, here's the announcement of us, for instance, enabling uh, game lift and having skill based matchmaking, something our community has been really awesome and allowing them to have like a much more better uh, game experience. Um, these are four elements um, that AWS have helped us to make the cycle a much more better game. Um, and I hope through this talk, you've been able to cover a little bit over the elements of what Jaeger is, um, and you have a little bit of understanding who we are, um, a little bit of a brief introduction on the cycle, and especially how AWS have helped us make a uh, cycle a reality. Um, and that's about it. So I think for now, we're going to open up questions. Yeah, sure. So Joachim, thank you very much. And wait, let me show my face again. Yeah, cool. So Joachim, thank you very much at first for, for this presentation. And I mean, pretty refreshing. And, and thanks for opening up yourself so honest about the, de the development and stuff, especially also seeing that also Jaga is in the game since more than 20 years. You are still doing a lot of trying out, you know, trial and error and testing it on a constant basis. And I mean, we all know that the times are over of of developing a game, polishing yeah. it and putting it in a box and on the shelf and selling it. Those times are over. It's now about constant evolution, trying out, doing something new, failing for sure. And, but then constantly testing it out, you know, and, yeah. and running the game as long as possible and, and adding new contents, uh, content pieces as we go. Um, so before we open it up for, for questions from the audience, if there are any, um, I, I have one question or maybe even two. Um, one thing I'm always interested in to, to get from people from the games industry is um, their vision or idea or thinking around new technologies that are, that are coming, that are, that are on the horizon. So trends you see coming where you say they could have potentially a big influence on future game development. And maybe there are things you're looking into for private reason or because someone asked you to, because of your role as a technical director. What do you say? What are maybe one or two trends you see coming that could be potentially be super important for future game development or current okay. game development even? Yeah, no, so I, I think like a lot of times now, for instance, for cloud hosting, we like, we host the whole game. Uh, but we, for instance, on instance, the client is always simulated quite a lot on the individual machine that they're playing with and all that stuff. And I think there's certainly been a lot of initiatives to try like streaming the game over and so on and so forth. But I'm really interested about where cloud computation can maybe leverage certain uh, parts of game development itself. Let's say like physical collision, let's say really complicated rendering and maybe even the language stuff that was explained by IO. And I think trying to say where the hardware and the box that you have yourself, um, maybe that needs to be a very small representative about what actually gets presented to us the client. And then we can find small elements of that individual part. Uh, furthermore, I think especially uh, I've done a lot of front-end engineering and let's say Unreal Engine, a lot of those ones, we still code a lot in C++ and the, the amount of things we're able to use managed languages in C Sharp and uh, other things, you can just see the amount of more open shareness we can do for our different technologies. So I think certainly initiatives such as Rust and other more popular uh, languages to move into even the ways we build games. Um, I 
really can see that that increases will increase the efficiency and speed that we'll be able to develop the games. Okay, cool. Um, a second question I have, um, because I don't know who is joining in today and, and what like maturity they have in terms of game development or running a game studio is, what advice would you give to someone that is thinking about creating his first or second game or even starting a games company? Is there any advice you would give to those folks? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a very broad question, so I would yeah. primarily answer as a technology person. Sure. So the um, the main thing, uh, the main thing is even something that we struggle with, and you can probably see that the more and more we started using is industry proven solutions to the game we're trying to make, and we were always kind of going back and forth between how much of a technology based company are we and how much of a games company we are. And I think, mm -hmm. especially as a technical person, I think you and working at a given company, especially if you're starting your own venture, you need to go either or. You need to either find a very small niche that you really want to develop in regard to technology and sell that really well, or say we're games for everything we do, and then be better at actually finding technologies and alternating those technologies than being the uh, fantastic programmer that builds your small things that you persistently have to maintain. Because well, certainly even you maybe have accomplished something, the um, like with even the technology you built, the cost of maintenance becomes much, much more higher. And uh, for us, uh, I would really say that I think that would be one of my main suggestions. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks, Joachim. Thanks for, for sharing those additional insights. So now let me look for questions if there are any. I see, I see one um, coming from Abi and it goes to you. Um, you are Akim. Uh, really had fun playing the cycle. Based on the platform porting plans you have, what specific challenges do you experience, especially seeing the Nintendo Switch logo on your, on your slide? Oh, I see. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I guess there's always uh, two parts to releasing on it. Like we use Unreal Engine, which is really awesome because I think that's also one of the don't build it yourself, use something else that provides a lot of the porting job to you. And I guess you could just see Fortnite becoming more and more open in regards for um, just like opening up the space to allow us to do the hard, like we don't have to do the hard SDK porting anymore. Of course, there's the certification jobs and all that stuff that is becoming, uh, that is always difficult. And uh, you always require uh, people to go through that and so on and so forth. And I think there's like, um, without talking about like very details in regards to NDA specifics, um, there is, um, it's it, it's very very hard like it's it's something where you need um, like i think a lot of times people focus just on the technology on the certs and it's as much more important if not even more important to facilitate the communicational aspects with the different platform holders and make sure that you totally understand their agreement because otherwise i feel like it's a lot of times where programmers read the cert documents and then start implementing them as a checkbox uh, but I feel like a lot of times it's more important than actually a producer do it, mm -hmm. facilitates those things, communicates with the platform holder all again, because that means that you don't fail the search over and over again, which uh, unfortunately, I guess that happened both for us and other third party developers. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a second question to you, Joachim, uh, from Natasha. Was it easy to get all your colleagues at Yaga on board with using cloud technologies? If not, how did you convince them? Um, I think it was. <laughs> I think it was pretty easy to explain, like even in the hosting requirements, but also like, uh, like it, it was pretty easy to uh, understand why we should use cloud technologies and not just our hardware requirements and all that stuff because we didn't have people to be able to do so. Um, so I think that was pretty straightforward. Um, I think it was the more difficult part comes just around that we are primarily a games company that always transitions. So we transitioned from being front end engineers to full stack engineers. So more how you interact with cloud, what are AWS, uh, I think the starter page that Sebastian were highlighting, I think is really awesome. And I think trying to our best to even just facilitate the learning resources about what cloud is, cloud is and how to use those things, I think have been most of the uh, actual challenges. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, cool. And by the way, Natasha, also, uh, my two cents on this, this is also where we can help from AWS directly. So what we usually do is, because we don't want to convince you on anything that you aren't behind and also the team is not behind. It's really about understanding what your project is about, what challenges you have or what your end goal should, should look like. And then we can tell you what you could potentially do with the help of cloud services at AWS or in general with cloud services. And then we take the step by step and see what solutions we can provide and what benefits there are. So this is something where for sure we are also here uh, to 
to help you on in case there is this need to also convince others, which usually is the case because people come with history from the past. They have seen something, they have tested something, it didn't work or didn't work well. Um, and there's always this, this, this constant debate, you know, what you should use, what tool do you do in house? Do you take a third party solution and, and, and all those kind of things. And, and we have many use cases and we ha can help you on that. And Last, last points on that is also this, this, the, the industry is constantly evolving. So maybe we didn't have a solution that worked half a year ago, but now we have something. So it's constantly evolving. So I also um, tell everyone, please do a constant check of new things popping up the horizon because it doesn't stop. Then I see another question popping up to me, are studios using game tech for single player games as well? And it's machine learning. So yes, they are. So please uh, don't think that Amazon game tech is only for multiplayer games, like the cycle, for example. No, there are many more use cases. So I highlighted the topics and analytics because also if you have a single player game, um, gathering the data and making informed decision based on data is something that can also come in super handy for, for single player games. And um, also other topics like translations into other languages uh, is something that, that could also work well for single player games if you want to bring them into other markets. And there are other, mo many more things. Or if you think about putting content in, content in front of customers like a new content package or other download material, all things you could also use the cloud services from AWS for. And this is just the beginning just to start. So yes, there are also use cases, quite a, a wide, fair, right, uh, fair range of services also for single player games. Good, let me cool. see. Yeah, Lars, you are popping up, I suppose. Yeah. I think if we don't have any other mm -hmm. questions from the crowd, um, thank you for uh, all for being here, by the way. Um, it was very interesting to to listen to what what uh, Sebastian and Joachim had to say. Thank you for um, your slides and for for your presentations. That was really interesting to get some some inside view on that. Um, don't forget before we leave, everybody who participated today and everybody who um, res registered will get a goodie email by us, uh, sponsored by AWS Game Tech um, with credits. So um, make sure you check that email that will arrive either today or tomorrow um, in your e uh, email inbox. Um, so yeah, thank you guys a lot. That was a lot of fun. That was really interesting. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. And thank you for, for everyone that, that, that joined today. And, and please note, we are here, we are meant to stay. Um, so please also, you get also contact details. You find me on LinkedIn and other folks from Game Tech. Uh, it's a super new team we have here now locally and please make use of it. And um, at least we can give you some more insights and then you can think around those. So we are here to stay. Perfect. Okay. All right. But now so I go. Thank <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for joining. And I hope we'll see you in the future with future uh, presentations and webinars and fireside chat that we will have. Mm -hmm. If you have any um, uh, questions regarding anything around GamesNet, uh, or, um, around our future uh, stuff that we will do for the rest of the year, please do not hesitate to contact me. Other than that, I will wish you a pleasant rest of the day and rest of the week and uh, hope you're doing good. See you guys. Cool. See bye you. Bye-bye. Ciao.